All right, ladies and gentlemen, in this video, we have one of my favorite YouTube channels in the world, and that's George Gammon. And today we're going to be talking about financial freedom. We're going to be talking about the, the state of this kind of forced reset that we find ourselves in from this kind of globalist Davos type of crowd. And we're going to be talking about, more importantly, how to screw our heads on right and continue to move in the right direction of, of freedom and, and prosperity. And so I want to encourage everyone to hit the like button on this side or this side. I'm very excited about this episode. And I, I truly appreciate George and, and everything George George does out there in the world. And so uh, last but not least, just a shout out to our channel sponsor, which is Vizla Silver. So thank you, Vizla Silver. If you're looking for a mining stock, be sure to check out Vizla Silver and uh, give us a comment down below. This is George Rules right there down below. And it's good to see you, George. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, buddy. Yeah, you, you, the last time you and I talked on my channel, um, we had about 30,000 subscribers and we're, you know, we're growing we're growing tremendously, and um, I, I always look forward to, to talking to you because you paint the bigger picture. And so right now, you and I were, were talking about what's going on and, and this move towards or attempted move towards central planning and, and, and the effects that that has. So why don't you give us an idea of, of where you think we're at right now in this kind of broader cycle and attempted global reset? Well, the main key to your point is central planning, and they, they want more socialism, um, whether their intentions are good or bad, who knows? I mean, who knows? But the bottom line is, is this is what their objectives are. So who, who are they? We're talking about the World Economic Forum. We're talking about these global elite that you talk about all the time, the IMF. And unfortunately, more and more of these CEOs that are head of these big companies, uh, Mark Benioff being one of them uh, with Salesforce, and there's several others. But these types that go to Davos, um, they have been they've they've drank the socialist Kool Aid, so to speak. And I don't know if they're doing it to because they think this is the future, and therefore they're trying to get on the right side, or if they actually believe this stuff because it sounds good at surface level. Uh, it, it makes sense to a third grader because uh, tr to proper economics and free markets, it is slightly counterintuitive. Uh, if you think that we're, you know, if you look at it through the lens of a 10 year old, uh, sure, if we are this big, rich company or country and we've got people who are in need, why not just give them some money? Why shouldn't the government take from some people and give to others who are more needy? It makes sense. And but then, of course, once you get beneath the surface and you start to really think through what that entails, then you understand how long term that's going to lead to disaster. One of the books that I've been really trying to focus on lately for my own thinking is The Road to Serfdom by Hayek. And uh, he, you know, many people took that book as a message that any move towards socialism puts you on a path where you're going to end up at totalitarianism and there's no other way out. But he actually said after he wrote the book that that was not his intention. His intention was to show that that these um, socialist uh, policies or whether it's socialism, the way it's meant to be defined or what I would consider welfareism, it puts you on this path where if you continue down this path, it will lead to the uh, totalitarian state. That is for sure. But it doesn't mean that you can't get off the path at, at certain points. So that's what I want to make clear to the viewers and that I've had to remember myself uh, this past week when I've you know, looked around me at the world and said, what the hell is going on here? This is I'm living, you know, it's like Will Ferrell and Zoolander, where he says, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. <laughs> and I, I feel like everyone else is taking crazy pills. And I'm the only one that's looking at the actual data and, and what's going on with, um, you know, the lockdowns and all the, the, the intrusion of the government that we've had. But my point is that uh, this 
seems good. That, you know, that, that's why socialism has been kind of a broken record. It just keeps coming back over and over and over again. Uh, although every single time we've seen it tried, especially when the government owns the means of production, it's failed miserably. It's absolutely failed miserably. But yet we want to do things that take us closer and closer to that end game. It's just kind of human nature and it's our uh, maternal or paternal instincts, I think, that we want to take care of each other. Uh, but somehow we have this delusion that the best way to do that is through the state instead of at the individual level. And so my point is with these CEOs, whether they're drinking the Kool-Aid because of just this delusion uh, that we have, that we are susceptible to as human beings, or because again, they see the World Economic Forum and the central planners and the global elites being in control of the world in the future, and they want to get on on their good side. Uh, I don't know. I, I I don't know. But I do know that we can uh, we can ca we can act as a counterbalance of logic by really getting out this message and reminding people of history and what has happened, and um, reminding people of everything that Hayek and, and Friedman and Thomas Sowell have taught us about the way not only an economy works, but the way human beings work and behave. And if we continually remind people of that, we, we've got a chance to get off this slippery slope. So I was watching or have been recently watching a lot of clips on Venezuela, like this uh, couple travel guys kind of went into the country and they had to kind of get guides because it's so dangerous. But I was just appalled that, I mean, most of the people um, are basically making like a dollar a month. And I mean, it's for to see Bernie Sanders when he was campaigning quite a few years ago, you know, campaigning Venezuela and now they're all silent. You know, that's a long term trajectory of what could happen. But I look at that and I just look, man, how many people have gotten disempowered um, and haven't found a way or they haven't found a teacher or the right ideas to get out of it. And, you know, then you look at America right now. And the thing that kind of really breaks my heart is the sheer number of people who cannot pay their rent or mortgage. I mean, we already had 75 percent of people living paycheck to paycheck before any of this occurred. And I don't know the exact percentage of people that are behind on their rent or mortgage, but I know it's not one month. I mean, it's closer to 12. And so what happens is like people have. Um, either from government response or they've just been so bombarded, but they've kind of lost a way to get ahead. And that maybe someone like that's listening to this, or maybe someone like that hears everything you're saying, they're on the same page, they follow you and I, and they're doing everything they can to ensure their own freedom financially, at least just to give themselves some breathing space. And, you know, you're someone that retired, I, I believe in your late thirties and so tell me, what are the most important principles that one can apply right now for finance, for success, for business to uh, get ahead right now? You have to be able to educate yourself. You have to be able to solve problems. You have to be able to um, just be self-reliant. You have to take responsibility for your own actions. You can't rely on other people. You can't rely on the government. That that's a road to nowhere. If you start, um, if you start waking up in the morning with the victim mentality that you don't have control over your financial future, that that's in the hands of someone else, and that the only way that you can get ahead in life is if you just vote in the right guy or gal. The, if you just is the only way you can get ahead in life is if we just have the right central planner. <laughs> that, that's a, that's not going to get you anywhere. You're you're just gonna you're gonna dig yourself into a rut that is very very difficult to get out of. So you've got to just really understand what the opportunities are, and then take action. I mean, it, it's it's such a cliche, but that's so hard for people to do is take action for whatever reason because they're 
you know, they're busy. They've got a nine to five job. They've got a family. They've got kids. They, they've got all these things going on. Or maybe they're afraid of failure. Um, but it, there's the neat thing about the world we live in today is that the barrier of entry to become successful is far lower than it ever has been with the internet. I mean, your YouTube channel is a fantastic example of that. Your backstory with uh, you know you writing the book and and going on the journey that you went on and selling it out of the back of your car. I, I mean, you're you're just the you're you're the quintessential. Uh, model of, of of what I'm referring to, and uh, you didn't sit back and just let the and get pissed off that you're a victim and you got no chance and you can't get ahead in life. Uh, you actually went out and and made it happen. And people have to do that, whether they like it or not, whether it's fair or not. That's not the issue. The bottom line is, if you want any type of financial freedom, you're you're going to have to get out there and and make it happen and and try to figure out what need you can fill or what you enjoy uh, talking about, and then just get out there and provide a service for the community, for the world around you. And again, the great thing about what we're doing today is that there's no easier time to do it because of uh, the resources that we have at our disposal online and to get our message out. You touched on something that I think has been really powerful and that was self-reliance. And you also said responsibility and there was a book by Ralph Waldo Emerson, I read before I dropped out of college many years ago called Self-Reliance. And that book really changed my life and my philosophies because it, it put the power in my hands, you know, and I guess I would, if you want to use labels, you know, I'd call you a libertarian. And one of the common threads between a lot of the most successful people that I've been able to learn from is they seem to um, have that self-reliance attitude with finances. Um, why do you think that's important? And how do you think one develops more of that? Well, why do I think that's important? Um, you have to go back to the simplest form of an economy. So let's forget that, that uh, you know, we have dollar, let's just forget about our current economy, just go back to an economy with like, let's say 10 people. And, you know, one guy is producing corn, the other guy is producing cows or gal, the other person is producing wheat and maybe cotton. Okay, then there's some other people to put these things together. And the way that you are able to feed your family or put a roof over your head is by producing. You have to produce in order to consume, period. Just think if you lived out in the middle of nowhere by yourself. You know, you see one of these reality shows with the guys that live up in Alaska and whatnot, and there's no one within like 100 square miles of them. If they don't produce, they don't eat. They, they, they simply die, literally. So that's the world we live in. I don't know why it would be any different just because we live in a modern society or that you live in New York City as opposed to somewhere out in the sticks uh, 500 miles outside of Juneau, Alaska. It's the same concept. You have to produce more than you consume, period. And it's the exact same thing with content. I mean, going back to that with what you and I do, I mean, you and I read a lot and, and I listen to a lot of audiobooks, and I consume a lot of content. But one of the things that I tried to do early when I started the YouTube channel is I tried to make sure that I was producing more content than I was actually consuming. And uh, that's the way you grow a YouTube channel real damn fast. You know, and you've I've obviously done the exact same thing. But people just that's why self-reliance, I think, is so important, because at the end of the day, that's the only way that you can get ahead financially in a sustainable fashion. And it's not the only way that you as an individual can get ahead in a sustainable fashion, but it's the only way that we as a society can get ahead in a sustainable fashion. We cannot print our way to prosperity. 
We can't just create more currency units and become wealthier. See, what, what the problem with the mentality that people have around finance and economics is they associate a green piece of paper with purchasing power. That, that's not really true. And the example I always use is if you are deserted on an island somewhere, and the only thing around you were a couple coconuts, some sand, and salt water, but yet you had this big chest full of a billion dollars, would you be rich or would you be poor? You'd be poor. You got tons of currency units, but you've got no stuff. There's no production. There's no productivity. All you have is currency units. You see? So so although I know your question pertained to people at, at the individual level, I think it also pertains to society at large. And we're really seeing that play out. I mean, I, I don't know that a lot of people, they, they might instinctively know something's wrong, but maybe consciously they're not thinking through it because they don't really pay a lot of attention to economics like you and I do, or maybe obsess about it like I do. <laughs> but just when I was in Tucson these last uh, couple weeks or whatever, you know, I was in Tucson about three years ago, uh, helping out my younger brother, and you, it would take you no more than five minutes to get an Uber. It didn't matter where you were. You could be in the far outskirts of town, five minutes, bam, you got an Uber. Now, you could be right in the middle of town, and I am not exaggerating. You are lucky if you get an Uber within 45 minutes. Lucky. Why is that? Because the government has distorted the entire market. And although people may have more money in their back pocket due to stimulus checks or uh, unemployment benefits or because their stock portfolio has gone up, or maybe they've gotten, they've made a lot of money in Bitcoin, or maybe they've made a lot of money trading cryptocurrencies. Well, that's all well and dandy that your bank account shows some extra electronic digits in it but you still can't get a damn Uber, you see? And try to go out to a restaurant. I mean, I, I don't know where you are, but down in uh, Tucson or other areas, there's been so many restaurants that have shut down, not due to the Cervasa sickness, but due to the government's response to the Cervasa sickness. So now you have much fewer businesses, much fewer restaurants, and the ones that are open are, let's say, at half capacity or something like that. So then it takes you two hours just to get food. You have all these inconveniences. Life is much more of a pain in the ass, let's say, now than it was in 2019, even if your stock portfolio was worth half as much as it is today, right? So again, my point is just to give you a story and to, to emphasize that it's not about the number in your bank account. Listen, if it was about a number in your bank account, the Venezuelans would be the richest people on the planet Earth. Because think of the trillions and billions of bolivars that they have in their bank account. But they don't have any stuff. They don't have any goods and services. So they're extremely, extremely poor. And, my, and again, the overarching theme here is that if we don't understand that the way to get ahead as a society is to produce more than we consume, to be productive, then we're gonna we're on that path to Venezuela. Because the problem there is they built their entire economy around one thing, the production of oil. Not only that, but they built it around $100 a barrel oil. <laughs> so you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Your economy is a one trick pony. We are doing the exact same thing right now in the United States. Not to the extent, but that's the direction we're going. So we're not putting all of our eggs in the oil basket. We're putting all of our eggs in the stimulus basket. We are building our entire economy around stimulus. So if we get to a point where that stimulus can't be can't be done, whether we get into a political gridlock or we get inflation to where the, you just can't keep printing all these new currency units because it exacerbates the problem, then you have the whole entire system 
implode in on itself. And that's the path that we're going on. But if people would just take that responsibility and produce more than they consume on aggregate total, that would get us out of this economic malaise we're in right now. And then, of course, the government would have to get out of the way as well. <laughs> so one of the things that I really respect about you and, you know, why I'm a why I'm a big fan of of just like kind of the way you show up is because, you know, there's a lot of people that talk finance or, or business or what have you, but they pretty much stay within the bounds so they don't ever rub the boat. And a lot of times it's because somebody has a business or, or what have you. And I feel like you are, I feel like you are on a mission or purpose driven in a different way than most people that I talk to. And I wonder why that is and if that's accurate. Oh, I, well, I, I mean, I'm suing the Federal Reserve. So I, I'm I'm definitely not doing what's best for my my business. That that's for sure. <laughs> I've actually had some. Uh, Got to ask you about that. Yeah, I've had some people that that aren't able to uh, to do my show uh, anymore because of that because they can't be associated with that. But, uh, <laughs> what are you doing with that? I forgot to ask you about that. So you're suing the Federal Reserve. Yeah. 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 So, well, I'm, I'm hiring Robert Barnes to do it. I mean, right. I'm a lawyer. I couldn't do it. I'm delegating everything to him. I just uh, came up with the, uh, you know, he and I were talking and what really irritated me is what they did back in 2020, where they just blatantly, blatantly uh, violated the Federal Reserve Act. And uh, again, going back to Hayek, you know, what, what, what is it that protects us from the politicians, from the central planners? It's the law. It's the Constitution. It's the Federal Reserve Act. Without those, we've got nothing. We're done. We're, we're done. Right. We, be, we go back to the, the, the Nazi Germany that we were talking about before, because the central planners have so much power that, that we can't that whatever they want to do, they're going to do. So my thing was back then, I was, it really irritated me that CNBC, that none of these really smart hedge fund guys, None of uh, no one on Bloomberg, no one pushed back against the Fed and said, wait a minute here. They can't buy corporate debt. Like how? What are you doing here? That, that's that's not legal. You can't do that. And Oh, well, they set up a special purpose vehicle. Give me a break. Come on. We, we know that's at the very least violating the spirit of the Federal Reserve Act. And if you believe, like I do, that the that the the, the laws are what protects us from them and what what really uh, solidifies our personal freedom and our, our liberty, then th that's a bad thing, no matter how much short term, quote unquote, good it did by bailing out the uh, the economy due to the, the lockdowns that we were having and everything else that was going on. So that was kind of the, the genesis for it. And I talked to Robert and he said, yeah, you know, we can definitely do it. What you want to do is you want to uh, request the documents from the Fed, and they'll basically tell you to pound sand. And then what you do is you use something called FOIA, which is the Freedom, Freedom of Information Act. Act. Okay. And so then you 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 say you sue them, but you it's I don't know if it's really it's not really a lawsuit like most people would think of. It's really you're just legally saying, hey, you need to give us these documents under FOIA. Then you have to go to court to prove why the the Fed is under the umbrella of the entities that that um, have to abide by the Freedom of Information Act. And so that's kind of the process we're going through. So Robert, I said, you know, how much does it cost? How much will it take to do this phase one? And he said, well, maybe a hundred grand. So I'm like, okay, well, let's do this. I'll put up the first 25,000 out of pocket and we'll set up a GoFundMe campaign to really kind of build a community type of atmosphere around this mission, if you will. And and really it's it's not just about you know, going after the Fed with FOIA to try to extract information to see really what's been going on there. But it's also about um, creating awareness in, in, in the community and in society of, of what the Fed has done, not, not maybe uh, intentionally or, or maybe unintentionally, not maybe, uh, maybe it's what they've done even legally, but through inflation, how they have really destroyed the middle class and they have turned our whole society 
into uh, speculators and they've really hollowed out the manufacturing base, but that's on a whole other topic. So there's a lot of, of benefits that I saw to actually moving forward with this, but um, I wanted to build that community. So we did this GoFundMe. I said, I'll match it dollar to dollar. So what ends up happening to get to a hundred thousand, basically I'm putting in 62 five and then everyone else, uh, as far as the GoFundMe puts in 37 five. And that's how we get to the first hundred. And I honestly thought that I'd have to do like, you know, I don't do much, many interviews, but I actually had my assistant in April say, OK, I'll do a, a lot more interviews. Go ahead and set them up because I thought I would I would need to promote that to promote the GoFundMe thing. And we hit our objective of the hundred thousand dollars in less than 36 hours. So wow. so there's a lot of people out there that really understand the value of this. And then if we're successful in the FOIA, then we take all the information and Robert wants to go all the way back to 1913. Hmm. So we then you get the documents, you see what was actually done with whom, and then you determine if there was, if and what was done that was um, a violation of the Federal Reserve Act, and then you go from there. But the first step is just to try to get the information under FOIA. So my point is, yeah, I mean, if I was motivated by what's going to be best for my business or my YouTube career, if you want to call it that, I definitely would not have uh, I, I would not have taken that step because that puts me in the in the in kind of a, a bad place with a lot of people that uh, are really high up in a, a lot of different industries. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so what what does motivate me? Um, I don't know. It, it's just, I always just talk on my YouTube channel. I just talk about what I'm thinking about at the time. And so it, whether it's personal freedom, th these are things that I believe in wholeheartedly. And, uh, I, my opinions have been shaped, you know, by a lot of different people growing up as a kid, seeing what I saw. Um, and then being not only an employee, but being an entrepreneur, being both sides. I think that's such a huge edge to really understand how the world works is to not is to is to in very few people have the opportunity to do that is not only be an employee for many different companies you know I had so many jobs growing up and I started working at 15 years old I had several jobs uh you know all the way up until when I first started my first business and even then I I worked for a lot of different people as an employee and then I worked as a consultant for a while but then as an entrepreneur when you're running businesses and starting them from scratch and taking them over and having to hire and fire employees, especially in the state of California, um, and you, you know, you're able to grow businesses to where they have maybe 100 employees and see the different phases of, of business and how the advantages and the pros and cons that a small business has over a small, uh, a large business or, or vice versa, something like that, you're able to get such a, a better more complete grasp of how economics works. And so that was a, a huge, huge edge. And that really shaped my thinking. So then when I started to read and watch people like Friedman and Thomas Sowell, as an example, and then listen to investors like Jim Rogers and Mark Faber and Jim Grant and Peter Schiff and Doug Casey and Rick Rule, and it, it really just the light bulb went on. And I said, you know what? These people are correct. They are correct. And I know they're correct, not only because this sounds like it should work, but because of my experience. I can tell you that what Milton Friedman says in Free to Choose is spot on. And I, and I know that it is because I've been there, done that. I've had the employees. I've been the employee. And I can tell you that that's the way the world works. That's the way human nature works. It, it works best in a free market society that's not constricted by the, the government and uh, where people are allowed to uh, make individual decisions for themselves and their family and do what's right for them, which leads to the whole entire society benefiting from their efforts. And of course, that goes back to Adam Smith and the invisible hand. But then it goes back to what we were saying earlier with people just simply going out there and producing more than they consume for the benefit of themselves, their own self-interest and their family. 
Beautiful. You give me, uh, you give me, you give me a lot of hope and optimism. You know, I'm pretty discouraged um, about what's happening, but you know, I think um, I, I really appreciate what you're doing and the and the you know the courage that you have. Um, it's you know, it's reassuring, first of all, and I know a lot of other people feel the same way. So, um, first of all, I appreciate that, and I know you, I know you got a lot going on. I don't want to hold you too long, but let me wrap up like this. Um, How do you get the confidence to go out and build your own path in life or stand your own ground, whether it's you were talking about personal freedoms or whether it's going out and accomplishing your own objectives? And the reason I say that is because, you know, we could talk till the, you know, sky turns whatever color about the intricacies of the financial system or what have you. But I think for things to change, um, there has to be a shift within all of us, you know, and I think you're someone that, you know, to some degree, you really mastered that and you found that self-confidence. And how do you how do you go about um, doing that or how has it shown up for you? Well, I mean, that's the way I was raised. I mean, I've got to give my father and my my and my mom pretty much most of the credit there. Uh, I was raised in a very, very unique way in the sense that, that my father always told me I was the best at everything I did, no matter how poorly the results were. It's almost like he brainwashed me <laughs> into thinking that into having uh, probably unjustified confidence. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think what, what everyone can, can take away, you know, I was listening to a podcast yesterday from one of my favorites, a guy named Tom Woods. I'm sure you're familiar with Tom. And he's a just a hero in the libertarian movement. And he was talking about how, he was talking about how people should ask them, kind of look in the mirror and ask themselves if they would have been against slavery, as an example in the let's say early 1800s so you got all these people out there that are virtue signaling on social media and all these corporate figures who are it's just nothing but non-stop virtue signaling you've got to ask yourself if those people would have been for or against slavery in the early 1800s right so think about what would have happened to your life if you would have been against slavery, let's say you, you would or vocally against it, you would have been ostracized by a lot of your friends and family. You probably would have would have had far fewer job opportunities as a result. This is just some of the negative ramifications that would have come your way. So and it's so now the people who like to claim that they're champions of, of social justice are the people who most likely would have been for slavery because the, what the, this claim to social justice and virtue signaling, now it's you get all your friends, right? All your friends like you, all your, you're not gonna piss off any of your family members. You're probably gonna be able to get that job that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get, or you're definitely not gonna be in jeopardy of losing your job, that's for sure, because your thought process is right in stride with the mainstream. Okay, well, that's not courage at all. That's that's the opposite of courage. That's not independent thinking. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be for uh, social justice to a certain degree, but it, it's, it's about independent thought and it's about being willing to go against the grain. And I think what makes that a lot easier and what's almost void in society today are principles just principles. And let me give you an example. Back, in, I started talking about the Cervasa sickness in January of 2020, okay? And I was saying that, that and, and I've got to give all the credit to Eric Townsend, a great buddy of mine with Macro Voices, and Chris Martinson, Dr. Chris Martinson, because I was listening to them and other people and saying, wait a minute here, this, you know, back then it was just something that was isolated to China. 
And I'm like, wait a minute. If, if And I was looking at the numbers, like the, the R0 value as an example. I'm like, okay, if this is the R0 value, then this could be a problem here. Th this could this could spread and it could happen very, very quickly. And back then you didn't know what the numbers were. You didn't know how, what the case fatality rate would be. You didn't know any of that stuff. So as it went on, I'm like, okay, this can really be bad here. This could really cause a lot of economic fallout. This could really decrease our freedoms. We could go into martial law. We could become a police state in, in a lot of different countries and also in the United States. And back then, everyone was telling me I was a conspiracy theorist. Oh, your tinfoil hat. You don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. This will never, ever happen. Right. Well, sure enough, it did. And then you see the canceling of sporting events, you know, the Olympics, all of these things. And it was just kind of this domino effect where, you, and again, back then we didn't have very good data. We didn't really understand that this really only affects um, the pe people that are older or, or that uh, have uh, uh, comorbidities, let's call it to, to use the correct term. Really, it only affects people who are extremely old and people who are overweight or have some sort of lung issue. So these are people that, yes, there's, uh, you know, they have a problem with it, but everyone else, it's, you really don't have a problem with it at all. You know, you didn't know any of this back then. So you're completely having to guess. That's my point. And about, and at many times it looked like, you know, if the government doesn't lock down, then this could, this could wipe out half the population of the world. Right? So what do you do? And back then I said, and I was on several podcasts and I would say over and over again, because they'd ask me and I'd be like, I don't know what you do, but I, I know what we don't do. And that's get government involved. I don't know how bad this is going to be. I don't know if it's going to be a nothing burger or it's going to, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm not a scientist. But I do know that what should happen is the government should just give us the information and they should let the individual decide what they want to do. D does the individual want to lock themselves in their house? If so, fine, go ahead and do it. If they don't, then that's their, then that's their choice. If the individual wants to wear a mask, if they want to shut down their business, that's fine. That's their choice. But it should be left to the individual. If you get government involved, they're going to cross that line and you're going to give them powers that you are never, ever going to get back. They're never going to release that power. And that's going. So whatever happens with this cervasa sickness, I promise you that it's going to we're going to exacerbate the problem long term if we use central planning to try to solve this, quote unquote, problem. Right. And, and, tr and again, it seems easy to be able to say that today because we have all the data. But back then, that was a difficult position. It really was, Jake. It was a tough, tough position. Because again, you didn't know whether this thing was going to wipe out half of humanity. And um, my point is the, the, the reason I was able to hold that position, and when it was very, very, very unpopular, even with 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 conservatives, yeah. e with everybody, you know, is because I had principles. That the principles were kind of the rudder. It, they, they were the rudder for the boat when the waters get very turbulent and, and you don't know, you can't make rhyme or reason of what's going on or in the world around you. Or you don't really know what you should do. You don't know what the correct decision. You don't know what's right or wrong. And I mean, this is what we're living through right now is a great example of that. I think you have to go back to your principles. And if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, right? And I think that's the problem or one of the big problems with society today and with the, the politicians on the right and the left is they don't have any grounding principles like Ron Paul did. That's a great, that's probably the best example I can give you. Ron Paul was so consistent over the years, no matter what was happening. I mean, 70s, the inflation of the 70s, the 80s, Reagan, Clinton, Obama, Bush, wars, the, the war on drugs, the war on terror. Ron Paul 
was always consistent and he had any he, he obtained so much respect for that and more than not he was on the right side when it was very difficult you know you go back to the the war with i with iraq right remember how unpopular that was to have that position that ron paul took back then but why was he able to do that most likely because he was principled he he wasn't trying to just use his human intuition and emotion to sit there and say, okay, we need to do this now. We need to do this now. Well, why? Well, um, I don't know. It just feels right, right? That's what the politicians and really society does right now because they don't have those grounding principles. So if I had to impose one thing on your audience uh, or, or, or if I had to reflect on one thing that's able, that's been able to keep me sane and has been able to allow me to maybe make some good decisions in my life, it would, it would be that. Man, that was so good. It reminds me also, I, I love Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, and that's, they preach self-reliance, and the basis of it is having, is having values and principles. So my last quick question is just, um, what are a couple of your principles and values? I know you shared some of them, but is there any in this that are important, that are important foundations for you personally? Well, as far as uh, we need free market economics, that that's the path to prosperity is uh, and we need to put the emphasis not on the the group, but the emphasis needs to be on the individual. So in terms of of, you know, historical labels, we we want classic liberalism. That that's, should be our objective, classic liberalism. So we want liberty for the individual. We need to understand that although government, and it's arguable, may be necessary for the rule of law, for the military, and for a couple other small things, we, we, need, to, we need, I believe, you should have the principal understanding that when you're dealing with the government, you're dealing with Hannibal Lecter in the sense that remember in Silence of the Lambs, Jodie Foster had to deal with Hannibal Lecter because it was the only way to get Buffalo Bill or whatever the, the, the real bad guy's name was. I think it was Buffalo Bill. Right. But but they knew that if they dealt with Hannibal Lecter, you were playing with fire and you wanted to deal with him as little as as humanly possible. I think if people saw government in the same way, that we would have a much better society, that we only deal with government if we absolutely have to, if there's, if there's no other way around a certain issue, then you deal with government. But even if you do, you realize that you're playing with the devil. You're, you're playing with fire right there. And so if you, if you understand that, and if you understand that by people pursuing their own self-interest, that, that that is going to benefit society at large. So I think what I would do is I would say, instead of looking at my principles, just look at the principles outlined in Atlas Shrugged, Free to Choose, and The Road to Serfdom. And if you can maintain those types of principles, I think you're going to be doing real well. All right. For everyone listening, that was a really, I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed today's episode. If you did too, please give us a comment down below. This is George Rules. If you don't follow George, um, <laughs> we'll put his YouTube link right there down below. So you go over and subscribe. Um, have to say um, that was you know one of my favorite conversations and the things that I like to talk about the most. And um, so Sometimes when we when we when we get into the, the nuts and bolts of important philosophies, maybe they they don't have quite the clickbait of of the of the economic videos. And so I want to encourage everyone listening to please hit the like button on this video. Give us a comment down below. This is George Rolls. If you haven't yet, also go ahead and subscribe to his channel. And uh, just want to say thank you so much. I really enjoyed that, George. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure as always.